Thank you for taking a moment to view our presentation about installing and configuring ESXi 7. VM Sources Cloud and Infrastructure is a VMware managed services and cloud provider. We have a diverse team of individuals to serve as your first point of contact. All of us are based in the USA, but we serve clients worldwide, wherever there's a need. As critical infrastructure responders, we don't let hurricanes, fires, or pandemics get in our way. It's our job to make sure that your mission critical systems are online all of the time. I'm John Borhack, Lead Solutions Architect. VM Sources still deploys plenty of on premises systems, but right now our main focus is on migrating legacy VMware deployments to our VMware Cloud Provider Partner Cloud. VM Sources VMware Cloud is a fully managed single tenant solution at about one third the cost of the big cloud. We're not just saying it's less expensive. We're willing to guarantee that it's less expensive and provide a fixed TCO with unlimited usage for the life of your contract. One of the key features of VM Sources VMware Cloud is stretch cluster architecture, which automates disaster recovery. Leveraging pre existing metro area networks between regional core site facilities, we provision an active site and a failover site. In the event of primary facility failure, all of your compute will fail over to the secondary site automatically. Because we use designated site pairs, everything fails over automatically. IP addresses, routers, virtual machines, everything. VM Sources VMware Cloud provides the support you require where and when you need it. For day-to-day -day management, you'll rely on the VM Sources team that you know by name and have come to respect. For critical situations, we have a 24 by 7 knock monitoring all aspects of infrastructure and operations. In the unlikely event, that neither the VM Sources team or NOC can resolve an issue, we also have VMware OEM support backing us up. Let's dive right in and look at installing VMware ESXi 7. We've already connected the ESXi ISO image that we downloaded from VMware or our server vendor, and now the ISO image is loading to RAM. This happens pretty quickly on modern servers. Now that the ISO image is loaded, we're starting the hypervisor and all the hypervisor related services. It is in fact true that the entire installation process of ESXi occurs as a subset of the hypervisor. And as you'll be able to see in the subsequent steps, the installation of ESXi 7 is not substantially different from version 6.5 or 6.7. This is what you'll see if there's been no previous installation of ESX in this location. Otherwise, you'll have an opportunity to upgrade or reinstall. I'm simply going to choose Enter to continue. I'm going to choose my keyboard. I'm going to set a password and then repeat that. And I'm going to press F11 and we're off to the races. It's as simple as that. Now that ESXi 7 has completed installation, we're going to go ahead and restart the server. The default behavior will be to eject the ISO media. So we're simply going to press enter for a reboot. And we'll wait for the server to reboot completely. First it loads to RAM, then the hypervisor, and now our server is completely booted. As you can see, it's got a DHCP IP address. We are going to want to use what's known as the DCUI, or Direct Console User Interface, to set certain initial parameters before we move on to using the embedded host client. I'm going to go ahead and press F2 and enter my password. This is the Direct Console user interface. In reality, the only variable we were able to set during installation was the password. You can see that that reports as set. So we'll leave that alone, but we'll move down to Configure Management Network. And we can see that we're set to VM NIC 0, pretty standard. Usually don't need to change that. Depending on the physical configuration of your environment, you may or may not need to set a VLAN. 
We do not in our environment, so we're going to move on. We're going to select IPv4 configuration, and we are going to choose set a static IP address for this host. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my right arrow because I don't like to type, and I'm only going to modify as few parameters as possible. So I'm setting my static IPv4 address to 172.20.100.101, which is our lab network. The subnet mask and gateway can remain with the DHCP provided values, and I'm going to press Enter. Now before I move on, I'm going to be sure to go to my DNS configuration, and I'm going to set my host name. It's highly important to set both DNS and a host name for your ESX host. And I'll press OK. And then I'm going to press Escape. I'm going to select Yes to reload my network configuration. Last thing I'm going to do is go to Troubleshooting Options. And I'm going to enable SSH and the shell. I'm a big believer in SSH and command line diagnostics. And you'll find that I prefer to secure my management networks rather then disable SSH on an ongoing basis. And there you go. We finished configuration with the DCUI and our host is ready to log in using a web browser and the embedded host client. Now that the initial parameters have been set using the DCUI, we're going to want to go ahead and continue configuring the ESX server using the embedded host client. We're going to open Google Chrome and type in the IP address of our ESXi host. And we're going to append to the IP address UI, which is going to get us to the embedded host client. We're going to use the username root and the password that we specified earlier. And since this is purely a lab environment, I am not going to join the VMware Customer Experience Improvement Program. We can see that there are a number of default alarms which we will be taking care of as part of the initial configuration using the embedded host client. But the first thing we're going to need to do is configure iSCSI storage and then move forward. Let's go ahead and go to networking. We're going to choose add a standard virtual switch. And while an ESX server we could actually name the switch anything we wanted, we're going to follow convention and name it vSwitch1 using the correct case as well with the capital S. We're going to go ahead and specify jumbo frames right from the outset so that we can move forward with a solid jumbo frame configuration. And as the uplink for the virtual switch, we're going to choose VMNIC2 as that is the first of the two 10 gig NICs connected to our iSCSI storage network. I'm going to go ahead and edit settings on vSwitch 1. And I'm going to add the second uplink, which is going to be VMNIC 3, the second 10 gig uplink connected to our iSCSI storage network. And then I'm going to choose Save. Now that we've created the vSwitch for iSCSI storage, we're going to go ahead and add a VM kernel NIC. We'll choose Add VM Kernel NIC. We're going to create a new port group, and this is going to be VM, VM kernel iSCSI 01. We always create our iSCSI kernels in order so that we can apply port binding correctly. We're going to make sure to put this on vSwitch 1, otherwise it won't have any connectivity. We don't use a VLAN, we use air gap storage, and then we're going to set our MTU for 9000, enabling jumbo frames right out of the gate. Now, we don't have DHCP on our storage network. Most people are not going to have DHCP on our storage network. We're going to want to set our IP address right away. We have a convention that we use, and I'm following that convention. And I don't need to select any additional services. iSCSI is enabled by default on VMware VM kernel, so I'll go ahead and choose Create. Now I can go ahead and add another VM kernel NIC. 
This will be a new port group. This will be VM iSCSI 02. Again, on our iSCSI virtual switch. Again, jumbo frames right out of the gate. Static IP settings. And following convention for my IP addresses. Our practice is to increment the IP addresses of VM kernel connections by 20. In that way, we could have cluster sizes of up to 20 hosts without any overlap. Now that we've created two VM kernels for iSCSI storage, I want to go to the port groups tab and I want to set the network connections so that we can enable port binding when we configure iSCSI storage. I'm going to choose the lowest numbered of my iSCSI VM kernels and I'm going to choose edit settings. And I'm going to go to the NIC teaming tab and I'm going to override the failover order and what I'm going to do is I am going to take the highest numbered NIC and mark it as unused. This isn't my rule, this is VMware's rule. One and only one NIC per iSCSI VM kernel connection. Now I'm going to go to iSCSI 02 and choose Edit Settings. I'm going to go to NIC Teaming. I'm going to override the failover order. And because this is the higher numbered iSCSI kernel, I'm going to leave the higher numbered NIC active and I'm going to mark the lower numbered NIC unused. In this way, we've mapped each of our iSCSI VM kernels to one and only one network adapter. And when we set up storage, we will be able to implement port binding. Let's go to the storage. We're going to go to adapters. And we're going to click on software iSCSI. Enable. Give it a second. The first thing that we're going to want to do is add port binding. Because we've configured the network correctly, we'll be able to bind each of our iSCSI VM kernel connections. Now port binding is configured. Now we're going to go ahead and add a dynamic target. And we'll choose the address. And we'll choose rescan. And as soon as the HBA rescan has completed, you can see that we have a 300 gig iSCSI LUN available to us. Let's go ahead and choose new data store. We're simply going to call this data store iSCSI 01. We'll choose the disk. We're going to use the entire disk and we're going to create a VMFS6 partition. And almost instantaneously, we have a VMFS partition available to us. Let's take care of a few more details before we conclude the initial configuration of our ESX server. Let's go to Manage, System, and Advanced Settings. We're going to search for User VARS. And there are a number of ways that we can suppress alarms and warnings which are not advantageous to us. I'm a big believer in using SSH proactively as opposed to reactively. So I'm going to choose the variable user vars suppress shell warning, choose edit option, change this to 1, and select save. Now that we've suppressed the shell warning, we're going to choose time and date and we're going to configure NTP for our ESX host. I can't emphasize how important it is to set up correct NTP for your ESX host. It goes beyond logging and is especially important if you ever plan on using hyperconverged storage or networking. I'm going to make sure that my NTP service startup policy is set to start and stop with host. And then I'm going to go to the NIST Internet Time Service list and I am going to pick NTP servers by IP address. 
The reason I'm doing this is because we haven't provisioned DNS in our lab yet. Even though we've specified these two NTP servers by IP address, later after we've configured DNS, we'll be able to come back and change them to the pool IP addresses that I prefer. One final step, you'll notice that NTP is still stopped. We need to go to services and choose NTP and then start. Once NTP has started, if we go back to system, time and date, this does not always update dynamically. We may have to refresh the information in order to see that our NTP service is running. This concludes our initial configuration of your ESXi 7 server. I'd like to thank you for viewing our demonstration today. My name is John Borhek and I'm the Lead Solutions Architect at VM Sources Cloud and Infrastructure. You can reach us by phone at 215-764-6442 or email me personally, john at vmsources.com. I'd also like to encourage you to check me out on LinkedIn, look at my blog, or view some more of our videos on YouTube. Thanks again for joining us. Goodbye.